Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, everyone. It's morning here in Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh, good afternoon to those of you who are in North America. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about personality disorders uh, in this webinar and, of course, uh, with respect to how the MMPI-2RF can be useful in, in assessing uh, symptoms of personality disorder. So um, to accomplish this, I'm going to start uh, by uh, giving you a very brief introduction to personality disorders. Um, then we're going to spend uh, the bulk of this uh, webinar discussing how various MMPI-2RF scales can map on to different uh, types of personality disorder criteria. Uh, we're going to talk about some research that supports this mapping, although uh, not in great amount of detail. And then I will spend a little bit of time on the alternative model for personality disorders that is listed in the DSM-5. This is really where the field is going, and I think having at least some exposure to that that can be helpful. And then I'm going to uh, finish with uh, uh, discussing a variety of uh, uh, cases in which uh, the MMPI-2RF was used uh, in the context of individuals uh, with uh, uh, personality disorders. So just to start out, the, the current system of personality disorders in the DSM uh, is currently listed in Section 2. Section 2 is uh, are, are the formal diagnoses. Uh, in, in the DSM-5, and, uh, and uh, as some of you know, these personality disorders are identical to those that appeared in the DSM-4. Um, so there are 10 personality disorders in total, and they're organized into three thematic clusters, uh, and, and, and uh, these are the clusters A, B, and C. So cluster A essentially reflects personality disorders that are odd and eccentric, and more specifically, the paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal personality disorders. Uh, Cluster B refers to the personality disorders that, that uh, tend to be, uh, have emotional and, and uh, dramatic uh, and erratic components to them, uh, the antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic PDs. And then finally, Cluster C are the anxious or fearful uh, personality disorders, and again, uh, avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive. So we're going to talk about each of these personality disorders uh, with respect to the MMPI-2RF, um, and uh, I'm going to show you a disorder by disorder mapping of MMPI-2RF scales onto the specific criteria that underlie these uh, different disorders. And, uh, and this is uh, based on on a conceptual model that uh, I primarily developed though um, I do acknowledge uh, two colleagues in particular uh, who were quite helpful in this process, Dr. Mike Bagby from the University of Toronto and, and uh, Professor Jan Kamphaus at the University of Amsterdam, uh, worked closely with these two colleagues uh, for many years, and they had significant input into this model. But uh, the second step, of course, was also to validate the model, and, uh, and we tested essentially a series of hypotheses of what MMPI-2RF scales should be associated with what type of personality source in a series of research studies that we have now published, and I'm going to list some of those uh, later on when we talk about uh, research relevant to MMPI-2RF and personality disorders. But the bottom line here, in terms of what I want you guys to take from this, is that, you know, we have a conceptual model that has been well validated. And, and uh, there will be some instances where some of the uh, scales I had hypothesized would be relevant on conceptual grounds to PDs, haven't really been supported in our research, and, and I'll make that quite clear uh, as we go through uh, these uh, various uh, disorders. So essentially the way that uh, uh, the uh, PowerPoint slides are set up for, for this webinar uh, for the 10 PDs is that I essentially show uh, a paraphrased set of criteria for, for each of the personality disorders, starting with paranoid here. And then the next uh, slide uh, will be a direct mapping of, of uh, RF scales onto uh, these types of criteria. So I'm not going to go over the, in detail what the criteria for these personality disorders are. I, uh, I assume that those of you who are listening to this webinar uh, 
uh, certainly have some familiarity, at least with the basics in terms of what, what are the core characteristics associated with PDs. And if you're not familiar with those things, you probably will become familiar as we go through this, this exercise. So starting with paranoid personality disorder, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one uh, than, I, uh, than I do the others, just so that you get a clear sense of, of how I'm setting this up and, and uh, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish here. So I'm essentially broken the criteria for paranoid PD into essentially three groups here, a criteria that, that they sh you know, share a lot of things in common. And um, starting with, with the uh, criteria of suspect without sufficient basis that others are exploiting, harming, or deceiving him or her, I've selected some MMPI2 RF scales that I uh, believe are the most directly relevant uh, to assessing uh, this type of symptoms. So if we start with this one, RC6, of course, is the, is the scale that would be most directly relevant uh, to, to uh, uh, interpersonal suspiciousness and, and, uh, and the belief that others are victimizing him or her, but also more broadly, psychoticism, which is our sci fi scale that reflects a dispositional proclivity towards breaking from reality, uh, it would, it would be relevant uh, to this uh, disorder as well, and in fact is relevant to pretty much all of the criteria that underlie this pathology. Um, then we see uh, uh, criteria such as this preoccupied with unjustified doubts about the loyalty or untrustworthiness of friends or associates, is reluctant to confide in others, has recurrent suspicions without justification regarding the fidelity of a spouse or sexual partner, um, again, we would, uh, we would very much expect the same constellation of uh, thought dysfunction scales here. Again, RC6, measuring ideas of persecution, um, and mistrustfulness, alienation, uh, and so forth, and, and psychoticism being covering such symptoms as well, just being a bit broader of a scale. But that also included negative emotionality and RC7. Both of these measure negative emotionality, with the former scale being uh, linked uh, more strongly to the dispositional uh, aspect of negative emotionality, whereas RC7 is essentially a collection of various negative emotions, some which may be more transient in nature. But nevertheless, uh, these two scales measure negative emotionality that includes alienation, which is a negative emotionality construct that's rooted in the anxiety of how other people uh, uh, will re relate to us. And, and um, uh, alienation, of course, refers to the anxiety that others are going to be disloyal, uh, victimizing, uh, propensity towards uh, blaming other people for things that go wrong and so forth. So for these type of criteria, we would expect that beyond the, the uh, uh, paranoia and ideas of persecution, we would also see a significant alienation component and that is why these scales are included, and they have been validated uh, as such as well. What you also see on, on some slides, including here, is that there, there are scales listed in uh, parentheticals and in green fonts. And, and what, what or this might be more turquoise, but anyhow, but what this reflects are scales that are not necessarily conceptually or directly conceptually relevant to the disorder or symptoms in question. But rather, research has consistently found that these scales are associated with the disorder. So RC3 measures cynicism. Well, cynicism suggests that uh, one has a world view uh, about uh, the world being a bad place, that people are essentially selfish and only care about themselves. It makes a lot of sense, I suppose, you know, cynicism would correlate with paranoid PD, but cynicism in itself is not expressed directly in these criteria, so it was not hypothesized uh, to be relevant. But it does come out in a lot of research studies, so I listed here in, in that you shouldn't be surprised to see in the context of paranoid PD that the scale might be elevated. Uh, finally, final set of criteria refers really to, to anger and and more specifically, the hostile attribution bias. So it reads hidden, demeaning, or threatening meanings into benign remarks or events, persistently bear grudges, perceives attacks on his or her character, 
uh, or reputation that are not apparent to others and is quick to react angrily or counterattack. So again, this, this, uh, um, these hostile perceptions can in part be linked to psychoticism, but the scales are more, most directly relevant uh, to the hostile attribution bias and, 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 and uh, uh, proactive attacks to, to, uh, uh, to remove any potential threats would be aggressiveness, the Psi 5 scale, and anger proneness. Aggressive is a bit more instrumental with respect to aggression, whereas anger proneness is far more reactive. But in conjunction, they would all be reflective of, of, of the hostile attribution bias. Uh, what you see here are also RC4 and RC9. These are broader scales that do not directly uh, reflect paranoid PD. Um, uh, both of them have some anger or aggression items embedded within them, and that's probably why they, they tend to be correlated with paranoid PD in most of our research studies. Uh, so don't see, be surprised in the context of a paranoid PD to see moderate elevations on such scales, but they're not part of our conceptual model uh, for paranoid PD, and it's not necessarily the scales that we'd be looking for if, if, if that was a hypothesis I was trying to rule out. Okay, so I spent, as I mentioned, I spent a little bit more time on, on paranoid PD than I probably will uh, on, on the, most of the remaining uh, personality disorders, but it's also mostly so you can you know, get a sense of how I'm thinking about this and, and, uh, and, and how this works. So the next disorder, which is also a bit more straightforward, is schizoid personality disorder, uh, which essentially reflects pathological introversion or detachment. So uh, the, these criteria will all revolve around uh, introversion, social withdrawal, and disengagement uh, from, from other people. Um, so here we see criteria such as neither desires nor enjoys close relationships, including being part of a family, all, almost always choose a solitary activity, lacks close friends or confidants, other than first degree relatives. Um, the types of scales that would be expected to be elevated in this presence is the sci-fi scale, introversion, uh, low positive emotionality, uh, uh, but also more specifically the specific problem scales of social avoidance and disaffiliatedness. So essentially what this would reflect is extreme levels of introversion, and that is not wanting to engage with other people and not really wanting to engage uh, more broadly with the environment. And, and I think in a schizoid PD, uh, you would uh, definitely see these. Has little, if any, interest in having sexual experiences with another person, takes pleasure in few, if any, activities. This is really you know, referred to anhedonia, uh, which the scales that uh, reflect anhedonia is, again, introversion, low positive emotionality, and in particular, and more specifically, RC2, which is low positive emotions. So we would expect those to be elevated uh, as well. Now, you see here in the, in the parenthetical, uh, low RC9 and low activation. Uh, I had uh, expected conceptually that low scores on these two scales would be uh, relevant to schizoid personality disorder. This expectation turned out to be false, at least with respect to the, to the science. Um, we have failed to, to find support for either of these scales to be, uh, uh, to be related to schizotypal personality disorder in any of our research studies. So I have... Uh, uh, highlighted them in red text here, red as in no support, um, but they were part of the original model, which is why I list them and mention it. Um, appears indifferent to the praise or criticism of others. Here we would actually look for non-elevated scores on scales rather than elevated scores. And in particular, the types of scales that would, would uh, look for non-elevated uh, scores on are negative emotionality, RC7, which is dysfunctional negative emotions, and shyness. And in particular, we would look for non-elevations on these scores to differentiate schizoid personality disorder from avoidance PD. Because avoidance PD um, will look very similar on the MMPI2RF in the sense that many of these introversion scales that we just talked about would be relevant to avoidance PD as well. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, individuals with avoidance PD, they might be socially disengaged and withdrawn, but they very much desire uh, relationships with other people, uh, but they don't engage with, with others because of extreme fear of negative emotion, uh, extreme fear of, of negative evaluation, of, um, of uh, criticism and humiliation, 
uh, and embarrassment. So in avoidance PD, you would expect to see these negative emotionality scales, and in particular shyness, which is the social anxiety marker on the RF, uh, but you would not expect to see that in schizoid PD. So essentially some differential diagnoses there. And then finally, it shows that emotional coldness, detachment, and flattened affectivity. Again, both introversional positive emotionality, but in particular, disaffiliativeness would, uh, would uh, be expected here. So you see that the set of scales uh, across the board are pretty limited. It's uh, essentially introversional positive emotionality at the Psi 5 level, uh, RC2 at the uh, RC scale level, and uh, social avoidance and disaffiliativeness at the specific problem scale level. That's pretty much it, and not seeing a bunch of elevations and other scales. Now, in a study that, that I published with Alexander Smith a couple of years ago, we did show some potential concerns with discriminant validity in the context of assessing schiz schizopersonal disorder. Um, many of these scales that we just talked about are supported, but it seemed like a lot of other MMPI2R scales were, were associated as well, and, and uh, therefore the pattern was not as clean as I'm presenting here. But that was one study. There have been other studies that, that have been more supportive of this constellation of scales. But I still want to point out that, that this prediction might not always be perfect. In terms of schizotypal PD, which is actually uh, one of the uh, most heterogeneous personality disorders in the DSM-5, um, and it pulls from many different types of, of functioning, uh, a lot of uh, people automatically, when they think of the core of schizotypal PD, tend to think of the first set of, of criteria that I'm about to talk about. But many forget that there's a very strong interpersonal um, in, uh, components to paranoid PD as well, as well as extreme anxiety uh, that, that is sometimes uh, forgotten, but needs to be incorporated into a conceptual model in understanding this personality disorder. And you have to forgive these uh, brief little breaks that will occur throughout as I uh, continue to caffeinate uh, this early in the morning. Okay, so if we look at some of the core characteristics of schizotypal uh, personality disorder, uh, ideas of um, reference, uh, odd beliefs or magical thinking, unusual or perceptual experiences, inappropriate or constricted affect, behavior that is odd, peculiar, or eccentric, we would expect the thought disorder scales or thought dysfunction scales to be elevated. THD, which is a high order scale. Uh, psychoticism, which again is a sci fi scale. RC8, um, is aberrant experiences. And also neurological complaints, which is a somatic cognitive scale. But many of those items are things like there's something wrong with my brain, having strange perceptual sensations, and so forth. So we can expect all these scales to be elevated in the context of schizotypal PD, and in fact, our research has shown that to very much be the case. Um, but another aspect of schizotypal PD, or at least some individuals with, with this personality disorder, of course, as you know, you don't have to have all of the criteria to, to meet the uh, threshold for diagnosis, uh, is uh, suspiciousness of paranoid ideation which we already discussed in the context of paranoid PD, and it would be especially RC6, but also psychoticism. So it would not be uncommon to see RC6 also elevated in the context of schizotypal personality disorder. Uh, but the, the way that you differentiate from paranoid is that especially uh, you wouldn't see such a global uh, elevation across the board on the various thought dysfunction scales as you would see in schizotypal, and you also would not see so, so much of the social avoidance as you would see in schizotypal. Lacks close friends or confidence other than first-degree relatives. This is verbatim the same as for schizo, schizoid personality disorders. So there's a lot of overlap in symptoms across these personality disorders. So we would have expected the same type of scales that we just talked about earlier. But strangely enough, in our research studies, only social avoidance actually comes out as a significant predictor. Introversion, uh, RC2, and disaffiliativeness never seem to come out. So in the context of schizotypal PD, you might not actually see this broad-based introversion being present, and it might be more specifically tied to, to, to the social avoidance scale. 
excessive social anxiety, um, which in, now also ties in with avoidance personality disorder. You would expect to see negative emotionality scales, such as uh, the negative emotionality neuroticism psi 5 scale and the dysfunctional emotion, negative emotions RC7. Uh, but we had also thought shyness. Shyness, after all, on the MMPI2R is the best marker of social anxiety. But in the context of schizotypal PD, it just does not come out. So it's more broad-based negative emotionality that seems to be related uh, with respect to the MMPI2RF than, than specifically uh, shyness. So uh, certainly schizotypal differentiates from avoidant personality disorder based on the psychoticism and other thought disorder indicators. None of those would be expected to be present in avoidant PD. Also, avoidance PD is uh, likely to be much higher on, on shyness. Um, all right. So moving on, uh, antisocial personality disorder, which, of course, is a disorder that, that uh, you know, many have some level of familiarity with. Uh, it's one of the more common personality disorders as well, although that, I guess that depends on what context you're looking in. Uh, so a lot of this boils down to externalizing proclivities, uh, and uh, the MMPI2RF externalizing scales uh, would be the most relevant um, uh, to this disorder. So failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors, irresponsibility, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead, reckless disregard for safety of self or others, all of these are externalizing types of characteristics and the externalizing scales, including BXD, which is the behavioral externalizing dysfunction higher order scale, the disconstraint psi 5 scale, the antisocial behavior RC4 scale, juvenile conduct problems, and substance abuse, which are externalizing level specific problem scales. All of these scales reflect to varying degrees impulsivity, responsibility, norm violation, and, and uh, recklessness, and would all be expected to be elevated in the context of antisocial PD. But there are also more uh, types of, of uh, criteria to this disorder, more specifically deceitfulness and being conning and manipulative. There's no scale on MMPI2RF that is a direct measure of deceitfulness or manipulativeness, but those types of symptoms and traits are really embedded within some scales, and especially the aggressiveness I5 scale and RC9, uh, hypomanic activation, actually get a lot of this interpersonal antagonism type traits, including the deceitfulness and manipulativeness, but also low interpersonal passivity, which really gets a domineering and, and uh, socially uh, uh, potent interpersonal style, and low shyness, which reflects a lack of social anxiety and, and, and uh, feeling quite comfortable uh, in, in, around other people. Uh, so in the context of, of an antisocial PD, and you see conning, manipulative, and deceitful traits, you would also expect some of these scales to be present. Irritability and aggressiveness, we look more specifically at scales that in, incorporates such traits. Anger proneness gets at the irritability part. Aggression gets at aggressiveness, and here we're talking more about reactive aggression rather than, than instrumental aggression. And RC9 uh, also has a lot of items on it that refers to aggressive behavior. And then finally, we have lack of remorse. There's no lack of remorse scale on MMPI2RF, so we kind of have to extrapolate here a bit. But the, again, this is part of the broader interpersonal antagonism constellation of scales. So again, aggressiveness at the Psi 5 scale level kind of gets to some of this callous, uh, lacking in empathy and remorse type characteristics, uh, along with several others. RC9, um, to some degree, has some of these embedded within it as well, although not to the same degree as aggressiveness. Disaffiliativeness, we had expected, but it never actually comes out, uh, at least when we specifically look at antisocial PD. It does in some of our more uh, strict psychopathy studies. And low levels of negative emotionality. Uh, negative emotionality, um, you know, measures guilt, among other things. So there are low scores on RC7 to suggest a lack of guilt and remorse. So in terms of borderline personality disorder, which I'm sure many of you are aware, is by far the most heterogeneous personality disorder. In fact, I would uh, 
let's say, most heterogeneous mental disorder period. Uh, so that, of course, means that virtually all MMPI-2 RF scales, to some degree, are going to be uh, uh, potentially relevant here. Um, and some scales are going to be likely better at picking up some symptoms than, uh, than others. There are many symptoms or traits embedded within BPD uh, that do not have direct MMPI-2 RF scale equivalents. Uh, uh, but we know from research, nevertheless, that uh, the MMPI2RF is still um, uh, related to some of these uh, uh, symptoms and scales uh, or uh, symptoms and traits. And, and uh, uh, a lot of this that I'm going over here has actually been validated in, in, in our research studies. So we look at, at the, some of the interpersonal components, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, a pattern of unstable uh, and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of idealization, devaluation. Um, here we would look for some level of interpersonal scales, but also uh, emotional dysregulation. Um, uh, family problems is a scale that actually comes out quite a bit, even though it's quite specific to family problems. Um, uh, it includes romantic partners, which a lot of this, uh, uh, this type of symptoms tend to uh, be most relevant, not exclusively so, but often relevant in the context of BPD. But also more broadly, negative emotionality, where, which goes as far as the higher order scale, emotional internalizing dysfunction, and the two negative emotionality scales that we already talked about quite a bit, um, they would be expected to be elevated as well, um, especially given this type of splitting uh, behavior, but family problems in particular for the symptom. Identity disturbance, marked and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. There is no identity disturbance scale on the RF, but the self-doubt scale uh, would be the most relevant and certainly is highly correlated with BPD, but also more broadly, again, we come back to this frequently, are the negative emotionality scales. BPD, after all, is very much a, a disorder of extreme emotional dysregulation that kind of explains a lot of these uh, underlying characteristics. Um, at least if you uh, believe some of Marsha Linehan's work. Uh, impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging. Now we're actually getting more into the externalizing components of BPD. So here we see behavioral externalizing dysfunction, high order scale, disconstraint, but also RC4, which is more broad externalizing antisocial behavior scale that gets at things like impulsivity and substance abuse and so forth. And more specifically, of course, the substance abuse specific problem scales would all be relevant. So now we're already seeing that we're pulling from broad domains of both internalizing and externalizing, and we've only gone through a few of the criteria. Uh, recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures or threats or self-mutilating behavior, um, uh, the suicide uh, death ideation scale, uh, which is uh, tied to BPD as well in our research, would be most specifically related but also more broadly, demoralization, unhappiness, and negative emotionality uh, are, are expected to be relevant as well. Affective instability due to marked reactivity and mood. By the way, BPD is the only B, uh, PD that gets two slides here. Again, a statement to its heterogeneity. Uh, affective instability, of course, uh, pertains to a lot of different internalizing scales. Uh, including broadly emotional internalizing dysfunction at the high order level, negative emotionality scales, demoralization as uh, reflected in RCD. But in particular, what I have often seen, and this is a bit anecdotal, but it's definitely supported by research, is what I would call the trifecta of emotional dysregulation. So oftentimes in the context of EPD profiles, you'll see stress, worry, anxiety, and anger proneness. Those three scales are located next to one another in the internalizing specific problem scales chart. And you oftentimes see all of them being highly elevated or even maxed out. So uh, that in conjunction would reflect serious emotional dysregulation and affective instability. So if you see all of those three elevated at even very high levels in conjunction that is certainly a good hypothesis for affective instability. And if you see some of the other scales we talked about, 
um, BPD is a good hypothesis. Of course, we don't diagnose anything using an MMPI2RF, but it can certainly help um, inspire some, some hypotheses about diagnostic impressions. Chronic feelings of emptiness, which would uh, strike me as introversion, low positive emotionality, and especially RC2 would be relevant, uh, never comes out in any of research studies, not a single one. So that's why they're marked in red here. I would have expected those scales conceptually, but they don't ever come out. So I would not look for them anymore with respect to BPD. And in fact, there's no direct link to this trait at all uh, on the MMPI2RF beyond those two scales. Uh, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. Um, so here we look at anger proneness and aggression in particular as being uh, directly relevant and also supported in our research. Of course, negative emotionality and emotional dysregulation more broadly. And finally, transient stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptom uh, that are stress-induced. Here we actually get to the thought dysfunction scales. So um, RC6, of course, get at paranoia, and RCA, aberrant experiences, have a number of dissociative uh, 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 symptom items, uh, and more broadly, thought dysfunction and psychoticism. So essentially now we pulled from all three broad domains, uh, internalizing, externalizing, and thought dysfunction in the characterizing BPD. And this is not just the MMPI2RF here. This is what you find in research more broadly. The borderline PD is truly on the border of, of all three broad domains of psychopathology. So it's not surprising that this, you would see a ton of different scales being elevated uh, in the context of this disorder. And, and a lot of these scales, as, as I've just shown you, are, are um, also well validated in scientific research with the exception of, of the two uh, that I listed. Uh, BPD being so heterogeneous can also be said independent. We've seen in some of our research studies that different types of traits uh, seem to be most predictive depending on if we look at forensic settings versus clinical settings. Um, uh, in both, we, you tend to see some externalizing uh, proclivities, uh, but in, 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 uh, in um, forensic settings is mostly externalizing and actually psychoticism with lesser emphasis on emotional ability, believe it or not, whereas in, in clinical settings, it's definitely more than emotional ability and psychoticism with a slightly less emphasis on externalizing. All three are, are always there, but, but in slightly different constellations. Okay, histrionic personality disorder. We do not do a very good job of getting at histrionic PD uh, with, with the MMPI2RF. And in fact, there's been lots of debate in the literature as to whether or not histrionic PD is a real disorder, uh, whether or not it, uh, uh, it's just uh, some combination of borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. Um, it is not uh, well thought of. And in fact, in 2012, Roger Blashfield, who's published extensively in the psychopathology literature more broadly and personality disorders specifically, wrote a great chapter yeah. titled Death to Histrionic Personality Disorder, published 2012 in the Oxford Handbook of Personality Disorders, edited by Tom Whittaker. It is an excellent chapter that lays out a, a number of very potent arguments for why this disorder should not even exist. But it does, so that's why we're dealing with it here. Uh, but we don't do a good job of assessing it with the MMPI2RF. Um, a lot of the mapping here that I'm showing you actually has come out of research, but the effect sizes associated with these associations tend to be very small, so I would not put a ton of stock into this. Uh, it's uncomfortable in situations which not center of attention, interactions with others often characterized by inappropriate sexually seductive or provocative behaviors, consistently uses physical appearance to draw attention to self, some significant underlying gender bias going on here as well that's quite disturbing. Um, but we would expect to see uh, very low scores on scales that reflect introversion. Um, so we see low introversion, low RC2, uh, low shyness, low social avoidance in the context of histrionic PD, which of course would suggest pathological levels of extroversion. But at the same time, this place rapidly shifting or expression of emotions, you might still see some elevations on negative emotionality and and the dysfunctional negative emotions, RC7, um, though the degree to which they're elevated 
um, uh, probably uh, depends on the level of, of, of uh, expression, which tends to be quite superficial. They don't actually feel the emotions as strongly as, as they express them. Uh, whereas on the MMPI 2 RF, on the items that on the live e scale, would certainly dictate that there would be some underlying level of actual feeling uh, tied to, to the expression. So the degree of elevations on the scale probably would be moderate as fast is what I'm trying to say. Uh, other um, exhibitionism and attention-seeking type of proclivities are reflected in the next set of criteria. So here we would see RC9 uh, activation and again low levels of social avoidance to be best reflective of, of uh, exhibition and attention seeking on RF, although none of these scales actually measure these things directly and these effect sizes are indeed small. And finally, suggestible, i.e. easily influenced by others or circumstances. Uh, the, the scale that was meant to reflect this uh, naivete and, uh, and, and suggestibility was low scores on RC3, you know, but um, in any of our research, uh, that fails to come through. I've never seen a negative correlation between histrionic PD and, R and, and RC3 in any of my research studies. But again, you see some pathological levels of extra version, and maybe some level of negative emotionality, and maybe RC9 and activation uh, would, would be present, but I wouldn't put too much stock in our ability to assess for that uh, personality disorder. So then we have um, histrionic, I'm sorry, narcissistic personality disorder. We do uh, a bit better uh, with this disorder. Um, and, and there's a more limited set of scales. Um, now, we don't have a direct narcissistic personality disorder um, uh, scale on the RF, of course, uh, and even a very specific grandiosity scale. But when we look at symptoms like has this grandiose sense of self-importance, uh, believe that others are envious of him or her. Most of the items that reflect grandiosity uh, appear on aggressiveness in, in RC9. So, in, in, in that, those are by far the two best predictors of NPD in, in all of our research studies. But what we would also see is low levels of self-doubt. That is suggesting that the person is not lacking in, in self-esteem and confidence. Now, here you see that it is actually uh, bolded and appear in green font, and that is because it, we would expect high scores on self-doubt uh, in, in uh, some presentations. Now, that might seem incredibly confusing, uh, but I'm going to get back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, believe special and unique, and so on and so forth. Here we actually have uh, linked psychoticism, which is uh, this uh, kind of like pseudo breaking from reality. And we do see that in some individuals with narcissistic pity, they're kind of border, bordering on grandiose delusional thinking. And we see in our studies, especially in clinical samples, that the psychoticism uh, does seem uh, to be a unique uh, contributor to the prediction of NPD traits uh, with the MMPI 2 RF. Uh, requires excessive admiration, is often envious of others. So here we look for high scores on negative emotionality scales and self-doubt. So why this, this uh, high versus low self-doubt? Well, in the literature, there's been a lot of writing about the different types of manifestations of narcissism uh, with respect to narcissistic pathology. And people talk about grandiose versus vulnerable type of narcissism. So the grandiose narcissism would be the one that's uh, blatantly accept, uh, exhibitionistic and, and uh, the individuals truly believe that they're superior to other people and, and uh, uh, will reject others who, who, who think otherwise. But the vulnerable ones are the ones that are a little bit more covert in their expression of their narcissism uh, and, and their self-esteem is quite fragile. They're hypersensitive to criticism, will react angrily sometimes when they feel like their ego being threatened, um, and so on and so forth. So the best way of differentiating the grandiose versus vulnerable manifestations of narcissism on the RF is by looking at, at self-doubt and especially the negative emotionality scales. So uh, in, in the context of low scores on these scales, it's more likely that you have more grandiose um, you know, phenotype. Whereas if, if you see these types of scales that we're talking about, but the negative emotionality scales and self-doubt are also elevated, we might be looking more into a vulnerable 
uh, manifestation of narcissism. Okay, so that's a sense of entitlement, it's personally exploitive, lacks empathy. Uh, we're again looking at some of these interpersonal antagonism type scales, such as aggressiveness at the sci five level, RC9, uh, but also low interpersonal passivity, which gets a dominance, uh, excessive domineering, and aggression, uh, which uh, has some instrumentally aggressive uh, type of items on it as well, in addition to more reactive aggression. Uh, it also is the best uh, predictor of low empathy on the entire test. That shows arrogant, haughty behaviors and attitudes. Again, aggressiveness and low interpersonal passivity would be present. So uh, a lot of um, uh, the same types of scales. So uh, aggressiveness and RC9, we talked about uh, low interpersonal passivity, uh, high levels of, of the SP scale aggression, and but then we would also potentially see some self-doubt and dysfunctional negative emotions in the context of more vulnerable expression of narcissism. Some of the, the empirical data we have have been in forensic settings, and there we tend to see far more grandiose manifestations than, than vulnerable ones. Okay, in terms of avoidance personality disorder, um, the avoidant personality disorder is uh, probably one of the most straightforward uh, in addition to schizoid, um, and uh, it looks very similar to schizoid, uh, with the exception of the hypersensitivity to criticism, fear, negative evaluation, and rejection, where we would expect to see negative emotionality scale, and especially shyness, and this comes through quite well in our research. In fact, if I would pick out any of the disorders that we're talking about, Avoidance PD is probably the best supported across all research studies with respect to MMPI-2RF mappings of, of, of assessing these traits. Uh, extreme social withdrawal and alienation, same type of scales we talked about in the context of schizoid personality disorder, uh, and feelings of inadequacy and ineptitude. Here we get back to negative emotionality again, but especially also self-doubt and inefficacy. We get at this feelings of, uh, of, uh, of uh, self-doubt poor self-confidence, and also inability to get things done, and, and, and so on. Now, emotional indicators such as demoralization and RC2, which is low positive emotions, are quite common as well, uh, and well supported by our empirical data. Uh, but as I mentioned before, negative emotionality and, and those types of scales should be uh, viewed as differentiating avoidant personality disorder from schizoid personality disorder. We talked about this. Uh, earlier. We also do a fair, uh, fairly decent job of getting a dependent personality disorder, though the scale that I would have thought was the critical scale in this regard doesn't seem to come through. So with dependent PD, we look at things like as difficulty making everyday decisions, needs others to assume responsibility for most major areas of his or her life, goes to excessive lengths to obtain nurturance and support from others. Low aggressiveness really gets at a passive, submissive, interpersonal style and dependency. So you think that low scores on the scale would be relevant to a lot of these types of symptoms, but for, for some reason, uh, which I cannot really explain, it doesn't really come out in our research studies. But what does come out that still combines these types of, of behaviors is inefficacy, which uh, directly relates to, to inability to make decisions, and, and uh, feeling like one is not an expert on one's own life, and interpersonal passivity, which gets at the passive, submissive, interpersonal style, the unassertiveness. So those scales do come out. As difficulty expressing a disagreement with others because of fear of loss of support or approval, now we're getting into the negative emotionality domain, uh, RC7 and negative emotionality and eroticism, uh, but also shyness, at the interpersonal scale level and interpersonal passivity as well. Feelings of inadequacy, high negative emotionality, and especially high scores in self-doubt would directly target feelings of inadequacy, poor self-esteem and confidence. Feels uncomfortable, helpless when alone, unrealistically preoccupied, fears of being left to take care of him or herself. Uh, here again, negative emotionality and anxiety under lysis but more specifically, hopeless, helplessness, hopelessness, inefficacy, and behavior-restricting fears um, uh, would all be relevant uh, to these type of criteria in the sense that they, uh, the person feels helpless, the person is unlikely to, um, uh, to, to, uh, 
to engage in uh, everyday activities unless uh, he or she feels supported. Um, and so, uh, so these uh, types of scales uh, have also been found to be relevant to dependent B in our research studies. Uh, look for introversion indicators as potential differential diagnosis from avoidant personality disorder. You don't see the same level of social disengagement um, uh, as you would see in avoidance PD in the dependent personality disorder. And emotional indicators such as emotional internalizing dysfunction and demoralization are likely common as well because a lot of the literature suggests there's a very high comorbidity of depressive disorders in the context of dependent personality disorder. So it would not be surprising to see uh, demoralization, for instance, to be elevated um, in, in the context of dependent PD. And then finally, we have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, I would say that histrionic and OCPD are the two disorders we do the worst with with respect to assessment from the MMPI2RF perspective. There are probably also the two personality disorders that are the most poorly articulated um, in our diagnostic manual, uh, not to mention uh, also uh, very difficult to assess using our various assessment devices. So, you know, just because we don't find good support uh, for OCPD in the literature is also in part because uh, the external criteria we use to assess for OCPD might not always be the best either. So it's preoccupied with details, rules, lists, order, organization, uh, to the extent that the major points of the activity is lost, shows perfectionism, really pathological perfectionism, interferes with task completion. Um, you know, we look for low disconstraint that's been indicative of compulsive behavior, but it doesn't really come out in our research studies. But we see some level of low scores on RC4 and coupled with high scores on RC7, which is negative emotionality, and also uh, cognitive complaints, which kind of get that um, the feeling like one can't concentrate and, and pay attention to things, uh, which is often seen in OCPD because uh, they're so preoccupied with perfectionism that they actually uh, have problems paying attention, concentrating what, with what they're actually supposed to be doing. Um, but these effect sizes are quite small, uh, so I, I wouldn't put too much stock in, in, in a lot of these uh, uh, scales as I'm going through here. It's excessively devoted to work and productivity to exclusion of leisure activities and friendships. We will see some, some level of, of uh, in a detachment and social introversion. The only scale that does come out in, in this research is social avoidance, not disabilityness, which is a bit surprising, but it's pretty consistent across our studies. So over conscientious, scrupulous, inflexible, matters morality, ethics, and values, shows rigidity and stubbornness. Again, the same type of scales that we already talked about would be relevant here, low scores on RC4, getting at compulsivity, and also negative emotionality and inefficacy. Uh, because again, they get so preoccupied with, with, with various uh, matters uh, that they kind of uh, lose, the, uh, lose the plot and can't really make good decisions and, and take care of themselves as well as, as they should. So unable to discard worn out worthless objects, even though they have no sentimental value, kind of getting at the more obsessive compulsive part here. Uh, we look for some elevations on various internalizing scales uh, that reflecting emotionality, anxiety, and efficacy. Uh, but they're not direct uh, measures of this. Uh, the stress worry scale is probably the best measure of obsessive thinking on, on the MMPI 2 RF. It's reluctant to delegate tasks or to work with others unless they submit exactly to his or her way of doing things. Um, again, there's no direct measure of this on the RF. It goes back to this uh, uh, need for perfectionism uh, that is uh, essentially reflected in underlying negative emotionality and obsessional thinking. But like I said, we don't do a good job of getting at the OCPD uh, with the MMPI 2 RF. Most of these scale staff uh, that have come out in our research studies tend to be associated with small effect sizes, so we can't put too much stock in the assessment of OCPD. But nevertheless, uh, you see kind of the types of scales that would potentially be, be elevated um, you know, in this context. So there's been some studies, as I mentioned, that have uh, evaluated the, the utility of the MNPI2RF conceptual model that that I've talked about in assessing personality disorders. 
Um, in, in, in a couple of studies, we used uh, two Dutch clinical and forensic samples. Um, uh, this one here was um, uh, published um, in the, uh, my, by my uh, former PhD student, Jamie Anderson, uh, and, and myself and our, our Dutch colleagues, where we found good support for looking at seven of the ten personality disorders, the ones that have the most uh, uh, variability and, and base rates. We couldn't look at all of them simply because there were not enough symptoms in some of these clinics. Um, uh, I mentioned a study I did with Alexander Smith uh, a couple of years ago that also was highly supportive, um, uh, replicating a lot of Anderson and Al's findings, but also looked at the full range of personnel disorders. So this was in a non-clinical sample, which of course means that there's some limitations with respect to, to uh, uh, generalizability. Uh, Jacob Finn and colleagues uh, looked at two different types of samples, community, National Guard sample, and, and university sample, and found some good support for the size 5 scales in particular, uh, which they focused on in, in uh, getting at the 10 different personnel sources and validating many of the hypotheses that we had set forth at the size 5 level. Uh, Natasha Zahn, myself, and, and our colleagues looked at associations between MMPI 2 RF scales and self-reported personality disorder criteria in the independent practice clinical sample, and again, found lots of support for hypotheses. So in an effort to summarize all of these research findings, I actually put together a table uh, where I show all of these uh, hypothesized scales at RC scale level, SP scale level, and, and the sci-fi scale level, and you can kind of see which ones have been supported and which one has not. Uh, the scales that appear in bold uh, uh, font here uh, have been confirmed in at least one study. The ones in also italics have been confirmed in two or more studies. And uh, if there's a minus sign next to the scale, we would expect low scores. So you'll see that in, in some contexts, some scales haven't been supported. Like I mentioned, RC9 and activation, for instance, for schizoid personality disorders simply have, have not come out. But by and large, for a lot of these hypotheses that we talked about, we have seen quite a bit of, of um, uh, support in our various uh, research studies. And you can study these on your own if, if you're interested. I'm also happy to send any articles um, uh, that I've talked about here to anyone uh, who's interested in studying uh, this a little bit uh, further. Uh, we've published on personality disorder spectra scales for the MMPI2RF. They're not yet available for clinical use uh, in, in, the, in the form of scoring. We need to get a lot more validity research before we can, can uh, incorporate them into the scoring. Uh, this here says in press. Uh, I have forgotten to update this. It was, this paper was actually published in 2018, towards the end of 2018. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a paper I published with Mark Waugh and Chris Hopwood, uh, where we developed uh, 10 scales. Uh, for the various personality disorders that, that seem to be quite promising with respect to how they relate to, to uh, personality disorders, both from the traditional perspective and the alternative model of personality disorders. So um, stay tuned in the sense of these scales do exist. Uh, maybe eventually they will appear, uh, but uh, we need a lot more research and evaluation before uh, we can be confident in them. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time on the alternative model personality disorders, not a ton because, we, uh, because I want to devote uh, some good time to the various cases uh, that I have. But I just want to mention its existence. Uh, I teach a lot of workshops and webinars, and, and um, uh, I'm a little bit surprised by how many clinicians are simply unaware of the existence of the DSM-5 alternative model of PD. Usually when I, when I ask, especially in person, in workshops, uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the alternative model of personality disorders. I usually get maybe at most 25% that mention that they have heard of it. So um, if you're sitting here thinking that, oh, I know this model, um, what is he talking about? Well, then you might be part of the 25% or less. Um, so uh, the DSM-5 alternative model of personality disorders was essentially the proposal for the DSM-5 in replacing the current system of personnel disorders, but the American Psychiatric Association that publishes the DSM uh, decided that this uh, 
uh, model was premature, we did not have enough scientific evidence for it, and therefore it was relegated to section three, which is emerging models and measures in the DSM-5, awaiting more research uh, before it can be implemented as a formal system. So uh, essentially in this uh, appendix, uh, at least with respect to DSM-4 and earlier, the appendix used to be where disorders go to die, but I really uh, hope that that's not going to be the case for the alternative model. And I think there's some encouraging news in the sense that the ICD-11 uh, personality disorder system has very much adopted this type of model, uh, and, and, and that is extremely good news, at least for the scientists in me. So anyhow, what is this alternative model? Well, it's essentially thinking about personnel source from a more dimensional perspective. Um, makes the assumption that anyone who has a personnel disorder needs to have impairments in functioning. That is, you have to have impairments in, the, in your ability to either regulate yourself or how you get along with others, and usually both. Uh, and if there's impairment in functioning, then they said a dimensional personality traits would be able to characterize exactly how the personality pathology is actually manifested. So a constellation of traits is more descriptive of who the person is, and, and, and why they might be getting themselves into impairment with respect to interpersonal functioning and self-regulation. Now, the alternative model, uh, in an effort to, to have some continuity with a traditional system, also proposed some personality disorder types. They took six of the 10 personality disorders that we've just talked about and essentially came up with different personality trait constellations um, that reflect each of these six personality disorders. So essentially it's have a transition from the old to the new uh, system. There also was a personality disorder trait specified that did not map onto any of the six, but still it could be diagnosed if a person has impairments in functioning and has some elevations on at least one of the different personality traits. And uh, uh, the DSM-5 uh, alternative model, personality disorder trait model, uh, essentially, it's a five-factor model, so there are five broad domains, so negative affectivity, detachment, antagonism, disinhibition, and psychoticism. But each of these traits, um, uh, these are hierarchical traits, so each of these have more narrow band facets uh, that uh, focus in on more specificity with respect to, uh, to, to the personality trait functioning. And, and uh, I can't go over all of those here, but the various traits that, that are um, uh, or facets of, of the broad domains are, are listed here on the slides. And there, are the, it's constellations of those facet traits are really used to, to characterize the different personality disorder types. Um, now, uh, in terms of uh, the, um, uh, oh, I was going to mention one example. So if we look at, for instance, something like antisocial personality disorder, in addition to having impairment in, in the ability to self-regulate, such as getting in trouble with the law and getting along with others in the sense that they don't form deep relationships with others, you would see a constellation of traits that's just persons impulsive, irresponsible, risk-taking, also hostile, uh, callous, uh, deceitful, and manipulative. So those would be the seven types of traits that, uh, that would reflect in the social PA in the context of, of personality uh, function. So, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, measuring the AMPD uh, uh, with, with uh, the MMPI-2RF, the idea would be quite similar to what I just described uh, earlier in the sense that we would map RF scales onto different types of traits. Uh, but here, the sci-fi domains would be such anchors because the sci-fi essentially reflect all five broad domains of the AMPD trait model. In fact, they're the conceptually uh, identical, and we've shown some good support that, that the sci-fi very much uh, captures those domains. Uh, but also, other MMPI-2RF scales can be used to further delineate, uh, similar to the facet type traits that we, we just talked about, even though there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, we can kind of get at the same type of personality variability using MMPI-2RF scales. So there's certainly been some studies to, to support this. In, the, in an early study published uh, several years ago, again, my former PhD student, Jamie Anderson, uh, actually her very first publication with me, um, uh, she um, 
shows a good convergence between the size 5 domains and, and the alternative model domains, which I'm showing the direct uh, correspondence here, and showed good uh, associations that the antagonism was best, uh, most strong correlated with aggressiveness, psychoticism with psychoticism, and, and so forth. And this was replicated uh, in, in a patient sample as well. Uh, and a study that we also published looked you know, more specifically at the other MMPI to RF scales and the relation to personality traits, as well as the constellation of traits that make up the personality disorders from the alternative model perspective, and we found some good support for that. And, and a lot of this work has been replicated in, in uh, patient samples. Uh, so in summary, the MMPI to RF scale can map on to the AMPD trait structure, uh, you know, the size 5 you know, uh, more directly, but also some direct correspondence with the lower facet structure. Uh, this is not one-to-one -one correspondence, but nevertheless, we capture the same type of personality variability. And the RF scales can capture uh, DSM-5 A and PD trait defined personality disorders in similar ways as we do the Section 2 personality disorders same type of scales, which really speak to the dimensional transdiagnostic nature of MMPI-2 RF scales in the sense that they're actually relevant to personality disorders, both from the traditional perspective that we spent a lot of time on, as well as the alternative model perspective. Same type of scales seem to be relevant uh, to, to these disorders, regardless of system, which is quite encouraging. Okay, so I want to spend the last uh, 25 minutes or so uh, talking about some uh, cases, um, and, and I'm going to uh, show you three cases. Uh, each of these individuals were diagnosed uh, carefully with a specific personality disorder. So I selected cases in which I was quite confident that, that individuals uh, very much had the personality disorder uh, outside of, of just the MNPI2RF because then there would be some significant criteria and contamination. Uh, so the first uh, a case is a man with an antisocial personality disorder, and I would go as far as uh, suggesting this man might uh, have significant levels of psychopathy. Um, this, is, this is a case that was conducted uh, here in New Zealand. There was a 40-year-old New Zealand, a New Zealand uh, man of Maori descent who was seeking parole. He had been uh, imprisoned for a long time. He had been convicted of aggravated murder and aggravated robbery. Uh, he and, and his... Um, um, uh, co-defendants had robbed a liquor store and, and uh, uh, ended up shooting the store clerk as, as part of this robbery. Now, in New Zealand, you might be surprised to hear you know, the, the default sentence for murder is uh, lifetime imprisonment, but uh, with the uh, eligibility for parole after 10 years. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is paroled after 10 years. In fact, this man had been denied parole for the past nine years and therefore had been incarcerated for 19 years. Um, and, and part of it was uh, his extensive risk history uh, and, and also his uh, problematic behavior for a long period of time while he was incarcerated. Now, this man had a long history of severe juvenile delinquency. He started very early on uh, as, as uh, uh, in childhood and early teenage years. He belonged to gangs. Uh, and uh, uh, was uh, uh, oftentimes involved in robbing uh, stores, stealing uh, alcohol. His parents were serious alcoholics, and he was drinking at a very early age because um, alcohol and other types of drugs were directly available to him. Uh, numerous formal citations for misconduct in prison, especially in his first five years, uh, for a variety of reasons, including assault of both staff and other offenders, uh, in, uh, smuggling and contraband and things like that. But uh, over the years, he had completed several programs for self-improvement, including education, and his behavior had vastly improved over the past five years. So I was asked to conduct a risk assessment to determine if he was finally um, met standards to be released into the community. Uh, so I'm um, not sure what's going on here. Uh, okay, so I administered the MMPI 2RF as part of this uh, uh, evaluation. Um, and uh, we always start with the validity scales, of course, when, when we look at whether or not uh, a profile should be interpreted. Uh, cannot say score of zero means there's uh, no unscorable responding. That is, he, he uh, 
he did uh, provide a response uh, to all of the test items. Uh, and in terms of the validity scales, uh, written and trend, which get out the random uh, responding and indiscriminate true or false responding, uh, were in the normal range, no concerns there. The five over-reporting scales, uh, none of which were concerning either. You see that the FPR is a little bit higher than what you expect in this comparison group, which is our prison inmates group, uh, but still not the, at a level as a T-score 77 where we would really be concerned about over-reporting. And then finally, we look at the under-reporting scales, and we do see that, that uh, there's some level of, of uh, overly virtuous responding here uh, associated with the L scale. Now, uh, the L scale is uh, uh, more tied to under-reporting of externalizing problems, whereas the K scale is more under-reporting of internalizing problems and suggesting of psychological adjustment. But if you look at the next slides, you see quite quickly that this person is not denying any externalizing proclivities. And in those cases, it could also very well be that the L scale is directly tied to poor insights. So you'll sometimes see in personality disorders that L is elevated, and it's more likely that it's due to poor insight than it is due to um, any type of, uh, of underreport. So if we go to uh, his substantive scales, we deem that the profile is valid for clinical interpretation. Uh, we see a quite dramatic difference here in that the behavioral externalizing scale is, is quite elevated in the context of extremely low internalizing higher order scale, suggesting that the, a lot of behavioral acting out that's quite pervasive in nature, coupled with feeling no emotions whatsoever, uh, which is in a way the classic psychopathy um, consolation. But in terms of uh, antisocial personality disorder in particular, I talked about RC4 and, and RC9 uh, being two RC scales that would be expected to be elevated. And we see certainly RC4, T-score 90, you know, four standard deviations above the normative mean, and way above what you typically see in, in prison samples. So this man definitely has some serious proclivity towards uh, engagement in, in, in um, um, externalizing problems, including impulsivity, being irresponsible, rejecting social norms and standards, and so forth. Um, but then we move over to the internalizing scales, and we see something quite interesting. Uh, if most of these scales are hovering around a raw score of, of zero or one, including the fearlessness scales. Uh, he has no fear, he has no anxiety, he has no emotions, he doesn't experience emotions, except for one. This is the anger proneness scale, which is also part of the antisocial PD constellation. So this man says, I feel no emotions except for anger, when other people are essentially trying to cross me and, and prevent me from getting what I want. So this is part of the emotional dysregulation uh, or dysfunction, a constellation of low scores. It's just not feeling any uh, emotions whatsoever. But he is very much acting out, and we see very high scores on juvenile conduct problems, smacked out, substance abuse, and aggression. So when this man gets angry, look out. He has no compunction about hurting other people. Uh, he does so, likely uh, uh, without much empathy for others, probably quite callous and aggressive in this approach, and has a lot of um, history of juvenile conduct problems and, and uh, past substance abuse. Now, interestingly, uh, what we also talked about in terms of antisocial personality disorder would be low scores on, on interpersonal passivity and shyness which we, to some degree, especially with shine the C here, but the very interesting pattern of scales in the sense that we see lower scores on interpersonal passivity, especially social uh, avoidance and shyness, uh, suggesting that I'm a fairly domineering, socially potent person that, is, um, that has no problem being around people. I'm quite gregarious. I have no social anxiety. But this affiliativeness is high as T-score of 88. But at the same time, uh, while he's so social and good at navigating social situations. He doesn't connect with people, doesn't care about people's opinions. Uh, he doesn't really want to emotionally uh, uh, link up with others. So it's a very superficial level of socialization in the sense of, oh, I'm not, uh, I'm very socially poised and I'm not anxious. I can take advantage of people, manipulate people, but I'm never really going to connect with people. And in the side five level, we see the same type of constellation of aggressiveness and disconstraint that we talked about in the context of antisocial personality disorder without much uh, uh, negative emotionality present, suggesting impulsivity, irresponsibility, recklessness, 
sensation seeking coupled with some instrumental aggression, potential grandiosity and callousness, um, but not in the context of negative emotionality. So quite significant level of antisocial personality disorder, and I would go as far as, as suggesting that this person uh, would be quite psychopathic. Uh, for those of you who, who were interested, he did not get released from prison, seemed to be of rather extreme risk uh, to society still, he, he, despite his, his uh, improvements. Uh, so the second case is a bit different. This is a person with, uh, uh, who met uh, very clearly criteria, diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. And uh, so this was a 30-year-old white woman who was charged with a uh, DUI, uh, uh, in fact, that was, I believe, her fifth DUI. She had hit another vehicle and uh, driven away while intoxicated. Um, the person that actually was quite upset was a person in, in that other car, and he chased her and called the police, uh, and, and they eventually intercepted her as she was uh, recklessly driving through the town, and uh, uh, she was arrested. She claimed that she was just trying to escape this madman who was chasing her, but uh, no one quite believed her. Um, uh, when, during the evaluation, which was for determining whether or not the drug intervention in lieu of a criminal conviction uh, would be a possibility, uh, she reported a significant history of physical and sexual abuse. She talked about how her biological father physically abused her and stepfather later on had both sexually and physically abused her. She talked about the unstable romantic history. She, she told me that she was bisexual. Three of previous partners, men and women, were all described as her true loves, which is quite interesting, uh, and, and suggests uh, the extreme emotional attachment to each of these individuals uh, over a relatively quick period of time. She told me she'd never held a job for longer than two years, significant suicidal ideation attempts and hospitalization since she was 11 years old, and initially these were in response to her sexual abuse, extensive alcohol and marijuana use since she was 18, and uh, four previous convictions of a DUI, as I mentioned before. So in the context of this evaluation, I administered the MMPI 2 RF, and uh, this looks quite different from, from the profile that we just looked at, because this was a pretrial um, evaluation. I used the forensic pretrial criminal group, women, uh, as a comparison. Uh, she responded to all of the items, uh, and uh, looking at the validity scales, there were no problem with the with, uh, um, uh, random or indiscriminate true or false responding, but with respect to the over-reporting scales, there were some particular um, concerns. Um, her F scales were quite elevated, especially FP, higher than what we typically see in these settings, but this could still be uh, likely uh, genuine psychopathology uh, and not necessarily over-reporting, especially with respect to the F scale, and we need to uh, consider that possibility and in the context of our history and what we're about to see on MMPI 2 RF, uh, that is more likely than at least uh, outright over-reporting, though it is quite possible that some of the scores in this profile are definitely exaggerating, so we need to keep that in mind and interpret with some caution. But also what was quite elevated are the um, are FS and FBSR, which are uh, get at non-credible somatic responding. And so I'm like, wonder, why would she engage in this type of responding on MMPI-2-RF? Why would she not exaggerate psychopathology? And the best uh, thing I could think of in the context of what I understood from this person and, and, and uh, how she was presenting is that she very much had the idea that alcoholism is a disease, uh, that um, more physical entity, and I think she was really trying to emphasized that she was an alcoholic, that I should take her seriously, and, and therefore, of course, uh, have come to the opinion that she would be eligible for this drug intervention and new conviction. But this means that the somatic cognitive scales on MMPI-2RF cannot be trusted. We have no idea whether or not they're a reflection of underlying psychological somatization, somatization sorry, um, and uh, uh, or whether or not there's some just uh, fabrication or over-reporting of physical health concerns. We just can't make much of that in the context of these validity scales here. And then finally, we see that, again, L is elevated. And when we see the rest of the profile, uh, uh, while there might be some, some pockets of under-reporting, um, this is likely also tied to poor insights. And, and the idea of, you know, presenting, look at me, I'm really hurt, 
I have all these problems, but I'm a really good person. And that, that certainly would be consistent with their general presentation. So I mentioned this is a case of borderline personality disorder. So let's take a look at many of the scales that we talked about with respect to BPD. And I said that essentially you'll see elevations of scales from all three broad domains. And that's pretty much what we see here. BXD is slightly lower at 63. So maybe not as much pervasive externalizing in this profile as you see the, the uh, emotional internalizing dysfunction in, in the thought uh, dysfunction. Now, I, men I mentioned earlier that elevations on the L scale could be associated with some underreporting, especially of externalizing complaints. So that is something that's worth uh, considering as well as we go through this profile. Uh, but, you know, by and large, suggesting some level of psychopathology across all three domains, and that this is consistent with, with uh, uh, borderline PD. Now, we're not going to look at this as RC1 because, again, um, uh, this is in the context of significant somatic overreporting, and we don't know what to make of that, so we're just going to ignore that. Um, but in terms of, of what are the types of scales that we look for in, in borderline PD, look for demoralization. RC4, which is antisocial behavior, RC6, which is, uh, gets at some of that stress-induced paranoia, RC7, which of course is dysfunctional negative emotions and emotional dysregulation, and RC8 that gets at some of the dissociative uh, symptoms that are sometimes present in individuals with BPD. She's elevated on all of the scales, and not really elevated on any of the other scales uh, that we hadn't thought about with respect to borderline personnel disorder, which is quite interesting. But again, this kind of gets at all three domains of psychopathology in the sense that she's emotionally dysregulated, demoralized, she, she engages some externalizing proclivities as evidenced by RC4 and, and has some potential pseudo-psychotic symptoms uh, that might very well be stress-induced, including paranoia and distrust for other people. Uh, we're not looking at the somatic cognitive scales. The type of scales that I had talked about in, uh, with respect to borderline PD on the specific problem scales were suicide, death ideation, self-doubt, and essentially the trifecta of emotional dysregulation. In this particular profile, all three scales are elevated and they're all maxed out. So when you see this type of pattern, emotional dysregulation is a very good hypothesis in the sense that she's extremely uh, stress reactive, has an intense amount of anxiety-related experiences and fright, coupled with significant uh, irritability and, and reactive anger propensity. So in, in, in the context of all three, we're talking severe affective instability. Uh, interestingly, what was not part of the borderline uh, constellation of scales that I discussed was behavior-restricting fears, which is also quite elevated at a T-score of, of 86. And uh, uh, that is likely because this woman also met diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, that's also why we sometimes see the scale being maxed out. The anxiety scale is the best predictor of PTSD on the entire test. So we're seeing some aspects of PTSD in the context of this profile, in addition to some of this more borderline uh, trait symptomatology. So in the context of PTSD, we sometimes see this extreme behavior restricting fear, uh, avoidance behavior, not engaging in everyday activities. And that has been, been uh, uh, empirically supported in, in other studies. Um, in terms of externalizing, we would have expected uh, especially aggression and substance abuse in the context of the BPD profile, but we don't see that here. And substance abuse in particular, that is a little strange given the reason why she's being evaluated uh, but uh, uh, this is what I'm talking about. There might be some localized level of underreporting here, especially of externalizing proclivities that we need to be aware of. But also it would suggest that, you know, uh, not all symptoms of borderline PD is present in every such individual, and, and she might be uh, far more uh, the, the emotional dysregulation and potentially the, the more thought dysfunction uh, constellation of traits and maybe not as explicitly uh, the externalizing uh, traits outside of her alcohol and drug abuse. I mentioned family problems uh, being um, uh, elevated in some individual BPD. We very much see that to be the case here, but also disaffiliativeness, which is interesting. It's not part of the BPD constellation, but if we think about what disability reflects, individuals who 
don't quite want to connect emotionally with other people, keep other people at the distance. We also saw the RC6 scale elevated earlier, suggesting some significant alienation and distrust. Um, that is not too uncommon when you see individuals who have rather severe abuse histories, especially sexual abuse, that they can quite connect with others, despite having identified multiple true loves in their life. And then at the type 5 level, we would expect psychoticism, negative emotionality, and disconstraints. Again, we see two of the three elevated here. Again, uh, the, the disconstraints, externalizing uh, type of proclivities are not quite coming through in this profile. But again, it doesn't have to be. Um, and also, uh, we have to keep in mind the potential for some underreporting. Okay, but by and large, uh, what we saw in that profile of, of a case that very clearly outside of the MMPI 2RF uh, did not need um, uh, for that particular case, she was clearly met diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder, even administered a structured clinical interview uh, for access to PDs uh, back in the day, and, and, and that was very much confirmed. Uh, the final case is an avoidance personality disorder. Um, I'll go over this relatively quickly so I have some time for questions. Uh, but this was a 25-year-old single white male um, uh, that was evaluated not by me but uh, by a clinical psychology PhD student, and I supervised the case. Uh, this person um, had been presented to a university psychology clinic uh, complaining about their school difficulties, poor concentration, uh, thought that maybe he had ADHD. Uh, but uh, during the intake interview, it was also quite clear that the presented with significant social anxiety, um, had a long history of social isolation, described himself as a loner, uh, he indicated concern that he will never find a meaningful romantic relationship. He mentioned that he did have some friends while growing up, but lost them in high school, uh, although he was unsure why he, he uh, lost these connections. He had no friends at all while he was enrolled at the university. And in fact, when he was in high school, he was so upset that he threatened suicide to his mother so he would get some counseling. He wasn't actually going to try to attempt suicide, but he wanted to get some help. Uh, he was prescribed antidepressant medication, um, but he said he didn't find psychotherapy particularly helpful. His father died from cancer when he was five, which was very traumatic for the family, so they had some grief counseling. He performed well academically in high school, but he was expelled from his first university due to poor grades, and most of that was because he stopped attending classes because he was too socially overwhelmed, but also there was some drug and alcohol abuse. But he eventually had re-enrolled at his current university after spending a couple of years working, started drinking alcohol and smoking uh, mushrooms and using cocaine in university as in an unsuccessful effort to make friends he quit using these drugs after he was expelled and was never quite dependent on them. Difficulty employment history. Also was afraid of bees. Had to quit two outdoor jobs because uh, he, he was afraid of bees. One of those jobs being a golf caddy. guess not the best job to have in the summer when there are bees around. Anyhow, uh, let's take a look at this MMPI 2RF. He met very clear criteria for, for avoidance personality disorder. And... Um, uh, in this particular profile, which is an older version because this is an older case that, uh, that was seen, um, and we don't have the RBS scale. That is the main difference uh, compared to what you've seen before. RBS didn't get uh, introduced until 2011 on the MMPI 2 RF. Uh, no comparison group here. Uh, you responded to all of the items. Uh, the Lydia scales are all fine in the context of time. I'm not going to uh, go over them, but this is a profile that's clearly valid for clinical interpretation. So the types of scales that we talked about in the context of avoiding personality disorder, uh, especially at the high order and RC scale level, would be in particular RC7, which gets at this uh, hypersensitivity to criticism, general negative emotionality and anxiety. But I also mentioned that Oftentimes, other emotional indicators like RCD and RC2 would be elevated. And this man very much had comorbid depression, which was secondary to his avoidant personality disorder. So you kind of see all three internalizing uh, RC scales being elevated here, which, of course, is also reflected in the very high emotional internalizing high order scale, this being a pervasive pathology. So in the context of these scales here, then you wouldn't actually be able to deduce anything with respect to avoidant personality disorder, a number of, of uh, uh, diagnostic considerations would, would be possible. So we look at more specific scales, 
And in terms of internalizing scales, we would expect to see uh, self-doubt and inefficacy in particular, uh, but also to some degree stress worry. Um, um, in this profile, we see uh, also some broader suicidal uh, death ideation and, and generalized uh, or specific anxiety coming into play as well, which may, it makes it seem like, you know, anxiety disorder more broadly uh, rather than social anxiety, more specifically might be a diagnostic hypothesis uh, in this particular uh, case. But um, uh, then when we see the internalizing scales, which are the ones that we would expect to see elevated in the context of OEPD, the pattern becomes a bit more clear. Uh, we see that social avoidance and disabilityness are both quite high. This is really keeping people at an arm's length and it doesn't want to engage with people. In fact, social avoidance is maxed out. So is shyness. T-score 75, suggesting a rather extreme social anxiety and fear negative evaluation. So, so these guess in the context of what we've just seen uh, points quite strongly to social anxiety or avoiding pushing out, or, and it's very much consistent with the types of scales that, that I talked about. Similarly, uh, negative emotionality and introversion, low positive emotionality, this is the Psi 5 scale constellation for avoiding personality disorder as well, uh, which was uh, among the scales that we talked about uh, earlier when, uh, uh, when I went over avoid, no avoidance PD profile. So, uh, whereas the other sci fi scales are not elevated at all. Okay. So, that's uh, all I really have. Hopefully, uh, you found uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation helpful. And uh, I've saved a couple of minutes uh, for questions, and the questions will be read by uh, Deb Rinwalski, who's our uh, Senior MMPI Manager for Pearson. Good afternoon, or um, for you, uh, Dr. Selbaum, good morning. Thank you. Uh, we do have several questions that have come in already. Uh, I'm going to try to categorize these by um, case questions versus just that uh, first part uh, of the presentation that you gave. So going back to um, borderline PD, there's a question here around why wouldn't RC9 or uh, hypomanic activation be listed uh, for impulsivity related to BPD? Well, that, that's a good question. But uh, when it comes to impulsivity, uh, RC9 is not as strongly related to impulsivity as, as RC4 and disconstraint. And these would really be the markers that I would uh, look for the most. Uh, I think that in the context of broader externalizing problems, uh, RC9 and also the Psi 5 aggressiveness scale, they get a lot more at the more antagonistic um, aspects, uh, which are more interpersonal aspects of externalizing, and not as much uh, of, of the pure impulsivity. That said, there are certainly some impulsivity items on those scales. Uh, but not to the degree where I would view that as a core marker uh, of BPD from that perspective. And also, uh, the science um, and the various studies that we looked at uh, wouldn't directly support RC9 uh, either in that regard. Okay. Um, how about uh, the low scores that you've uh, talked about? Does low have the same cutoff point for all scales is the first part of the question. And then if so, what's the cutoff? And then um, so a three-pronged uh, question here, maybe even four. Could you briefly describe how you came up with that cutoff point for low scores? Uh, was it based on prevalence or statistically based? Yeah. So. Uh, I didn't come up with the low scores per se. Um, low score interpretation is commonplace for the MMPI 2RF for most of the scales, certainly the scales I mentioned. Um, and the T score for a low score is, um, is a 38. In fact, I'll go back to the profile. Uh, what you see here uh, are three lines in the profile. You see uh, T score 50, which of course is the average scale. You see T score of 65, which is the uh, cut point for a clinical elevation. And then you see a T-score 38, which is the uh, uh, threshold for low scores on the MMPI 2RF. Uh, and uh, that was established by the authors of the test. And the reason why it's a T-score 38 is because it corresponds to the 8th percentile. So T-score 65 is the 92nd percentile uh, according to the normative sample. So if you mirror that at the low score level, uh, the cut point would be the 8th percentile. 
and that's the eighth percentile, and that corresponds to a T-score of 38. So I was just, uh, yeah, I would just be using uh, the uh, uh, standard interpretation of low scores when I would be looking for low scores in these various profiles. So there's nothing specific to to um, uh, what I was presenting per se. Um, I would just use the same cutoff. Great. Um, so I think this may be related to uh, the slides, and maybe the slides aren't color coded uh, in the handouts like they are in your presentation. But could you quickly review the elevated scores suggestive of dependent PD and sort of like how to grab those out of the handout as people take that as a resource with them? Yeah, so um, uh, I think. Uh, uh, the handouts, and maybe they've been printed in black or white or something. I don't know. I didn't personally print these handouts, so I don't know exactly um, how they appear. But uh, let me just go back here. Um, uh, yeah, they are in me. black and white. And so, yep, yeah, as you have things highlighted, it's really helpful, obviously, if people have like highlighters or uh, some sort of, you know, marking that yeah. they mark up the handouts as they go through it. Yeah, so for dependent PD, uh, most of the scales that are listed here are ones that I had uh, hypothesized and they have all come through in research. Uh, they should be coming through fairly clearly, but in terms of the ones that are highlighted here in red is low aggressiveness. Uh, that means that it, is, uh, it has not been supported in our research studies. Low aggressiveness, which would be indicative of passive, submissive, interpersonal style and dependency, which are, of course, traits that are directly relevant to dependent personality disorder. For whatever reason, uh, our measures of dependent PD in our various research studies are not negatively correlated with aggressiveness. There, there's just no correlation. So that scale for dependent PD has not come through in our research. But all the other scales that are listed here that I went over earlier have come through in our research. So uh, that would be the, the, the main one. And, and also, if something was not clear, I, you can also actually go back to this profile here, which is pre presented in black and white. Uh, here I've actually listed every single scale that I talked about for each of the 10 disorders. And, uh, you see that scales that are bolded are ones that are supported in research, bolded and italicized are supported in many research studies. But the ones that are not bolded or italicized, for instance, aggressiveness at the type 5 level for paranoid, uh, aggressive, low aggressiveness for dependent that we just talked about, those would be scales that have not been empirically supported, and therefore I would not necessarily use uh, with respect to these personality disorders. So this can also, since this is printed in black and white, this can also help you see which would be the types of scales that I may have talked about but have not actually been empirically supported. So uh, maybe that can clarify some things uh, as well. But yes, I'm sorry that you guys had black and white slides. Hopefully you were able to take some notes as I was going through my different color codings here. Yeah, well, that is a great slide that you just showed. Um, I think that's a new one, isn't it? Um, uh, it might be, yes. I can't remember yeah. when it was first heard. Okay, so just a couple more questions quickly. quickly. Uh, for patients in an outpatient clinic, uh, which comparison group data would you use if you suspected a PD personality disorder? Well, I would um, still just use the uh, community mental health center outpatient group that is available. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, that one is, is uh, pretty representative of, of uh, those types of clients. Uh, but, um, you know, what my, my uh, general presentation here has been far more focused on clinical elevations and not really considered comparison groups per se, more clinical elevations in context of, of the normative data. So uh, I don't think I have a great answer to that question, uh, but... Uh, yeah, if, if, if there was a outpatient setting, uh, I, I would recommend the community mental health setting uh, as, as the main comparison group. There is also a private practice or independent practice comparison group. So if you're seeing outpatients in, in more specifically that context, that would be the best comparison group to use. 
Okay. Um, do you recommend that uh, the 2RF be used in conjunction with other personality measures when assessing for uh, PD? And uh, if any, would you uh, suggest any? Yeah, that, that's a good question um, because there aren't that many great personality disorder or personality trait measures uh, out there that also uh, has very good clinical utility like the MMPI 2 RF. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, if you're really interested in, in, in pure personality trait uh, constellations uh, in, uh, that, that can sometimes uh, help um, uh, augment and, and elucidate some of these uh, uh, characteristics from the RF, I would probably say the NEO PI3 would be a good option, which of course is a good measure of the five-factor model personality. There's been a ton of research on, on the five-factor model and, and how it links up with personality disorders. But the thing to keep in mind with, with the NEO is that it doesn't have the same dysfunctional range as, as the MMPI does. So you might see quite elevated or low scores, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they go as far as indicating pathology I think that is still an empirical question. So one has to be a bit more more uh, cautious in terms of what those elevations uh, would reflect. But my colleague, Mike Bagby, who is a strong supporter of the RF, he, he also uh, thinks, finds the NEO to be quite helpful uh, in this regard in conjunction with the, uh, with the RF. Um, so there's some inter-rater reliability there. Uh, there are many personality disorder questionnaires out there that could be potentially used, but the problem is that they have such excessive false positives uh, at the, at the self-report level that, uh, and they don't have great norms, so uh, it's always hard to know what to make of them. And there have been some newer scales uh, available as well that, uh, uh, that are getting more at the traits from the alternative model of personality disorder perspective that could potentially uh, be used, but they don't have good normative samples. So it's, again, very difficult to know how to interpret them. So the short answer would be that if I'm particularly interested in PDs and I want to augment the RF uh, as a self-report tool, uh, I certainly would, uh, would consider the NEO. But uh, if you want to make absolutely sure, of course, I would uh, use the structured interview, like the structured clinical interview for DSM-5 personality disorders. That's more of a so-called gold standard for these traditional uh, PDs. The MMPI-2RF, of course, is not diagnostic in nature, and it, it certainly doesn't have perfect specificity with respect to these scale constellations either. Okay, I am aware of time, and we're going to probably have to cut up questions um, at some point, but do you have time for just a couple more, Dr. Selbaum? Sure. Okay. Um, we know that you're heavily involved in forensic practice. Here's a question regarding any general comments on the diagnosis or suggestion of PD in the context of forensic cases. Um, this particular individual indicates that after very many years of active forensic practice, they usually stay away from such conclusions um, unless there's compelling historical evidence. Well, the, the yeah, there are many, there are many, uh, um, issues uh, in, in that question uh, that would take quite some time to go over, but it's a good question. Uh, I, I think the general conclusions in terms of, you know, personality disorders, if you have a valid MMPI 2 RF profile, that's of course always a key issue in any settings, but the forensic in particular, you need to have a valid profile. Uh, I think the same type of recommendations apply in terms of what types of scales to look for in terms of a personality disorder. That said, the idea of diagnosing personality disorders in forensic settings um, uh, is, a, is a broader issue because, you know, personality disorders uh, uh, in, in many contexts are quite pejorative, especially in, in, in forensic contexts. Uh, once a personality disorder, always a personality disorder. Psychopathy is particularly problematic in this regard but also antisocial and borderline PDs. So I actually agree with whoever asked that question. I personally also tend to not opine too strongly about PDs uh, unless it's directly relevant to the psycholegal question uh, that I've been asked to address. So, but that's, that's a different issue than, than explicit assessment. I do think that uh, in terms of the assessment of, of underlying personality disorder traits and symptoms with the MMPI-2RF, 
because we've used forensic samples to validate these um, uh, scale constellations. I still think, think the recommendations would apply, uh, but again, uh, whether or not one wants to actually talk about PDs in such context is, is a different issue outside of the RF. All right. Uh, one final question about our related product. Uh, somebody asked about the MMPIA and ARF, and I did respond for folks who are um, interested. The, uh, the MMPI ARF was for adolescents, published in 2016, and is available. So, uh, Dr. Selbaum, anything related to uh, uh, personality disorders um, in your work, or do you know of any research related to this generalizing to the ARF? Version. Well, uh, there are a couple of issues here. Um, first of all, um, to what degree do we truly want to start diagnosing personality disorders uh, in adolescents where personality is still quite malleable and, and uh, we might not want to make such strong conclusions. So I'd be hesitant to talk about diagnosing personality disorders in adolescents. Saying that, I know full well that you do see these types of traits and, and symptoms beginning to emerge, especially in late adolescence. I, I, don't, uh, I don't deny the fact that there could be there. I would just be a little bit hesitant about uh, formal diagnosis of these disorders until people are adults. That said, you know, many of the MMPI ARF scales are quite similar to, to their adult counterparts. So uh, in the context of of personality pathology, I would probably expect to see the same type of elevations as we've been talking about, because again, the scales are quite similar. Uh, but uh, I say that, uh, and also noting that the amount of research that's been conducted on the ARF is, is far more limited uh, compared to the adult version. And uh, also, I'm not aware of a single study that looked explicitly at the MMPI ARF in the assessment of personality problems. So. I would have some hesitancy in this enterprise, but knowing, again, that the scales are so similar, um, you know, I, I think the same types of patterns of scales reflective of, of some of these perhaps emerging PDs could be relevant, but I would be hesitant. I will note, and this is more of a heads up, that I'm uh, working with a team of developing some potential juvenile psychopathy scales for the ARF. Um, and uh, those might eventually be published and, and uh, validated. So, uh, but that's specifically for, for psychopathic and antisocial proclivities as expressed in, in adolescents, uh, not the full range of personality disorders. Okay, and then um, one more question. I know I said two, but this, uh, I've been going back and forth with this particular individual trying to um, make sure that we get the essence of her question asked. Uh, and it looks like she's just asking for some clarification uh, to briefly describe the interpretation for um, the range of scores. So uh, I believe the reference to the dotted lines on the graph that show the ceiling and the floor. Can you um, talk, about, talk about those ranges and how interpretation might be impacted depending upon where they fall in that range? Yeah. So. Um uh, I'm pulling up the most recent version of the score report. So, um, and also, these I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Selbaum, but also yeah. then to maybe point out what is the comparison group range versus what is the floor ceiling? Yeah, so um, right. uh, these little dashes here reflect the ceilings uh, and the floors respectively. Um, they're not necessarily uh, used explicitly for interpretation, but, you know, it is informative to know if the scale has gone as high and as low as is possible. For instance, here in the borderline personality disorder case I talked about earlier, we see that stress, worry, anxiety, and, and uh, anger proneness all reached its max, which suggests about as much emotional dysregulation as can be inferred from the MMPI-2 RF. That can be potentially informative. It doesn't come with any other specific interpretive implications beyond that. Uh, then that the max scores have been reached, suggesting maximum severity as far as the MMPI-2-RF goes. Similarly, for the, for the floors, you see that some floors actually don't reach as far down as the solid dashed line, meaning that low score interpretation simply is not possible. You see that for a lot of these scales, for instance, whereas others 
the floor does go below that line. So for those scales, we can interpret low scores. So simply because of the range of scores on the scales, we can't always interpret low scores, unfortunately, on the test. In terms of the question about comparison group data, uh, which is uh, listed below here, uh, pro provide the mean score, which is this kind of dashed line, the mean score of the uh, 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 comparison group. Also get the sense of standard deviation, uh, which is um, uh, also print plotted in the profile. It's plus uh, minus one standard deviation from the mean of the comparison group. So anything in a score staff go beyond those ranges are suggestive of being atypical because they're either above one standard deviation compared to the comparison group or below one standard deviation if it's a low score. So for instance, here we see that this individual uh, is, is quite high on behavior restricting fears, the so T-score of 86, which is quite high with respect to normative functioning, but also far beyond the range of what you would expect in individuals in, in the forensic uh, pretrial uh, comparison group. Now, in terms of using this in interpretation, I tend to um, just focus on what is typical or atypical for that setting. My, my actual interpretation is almost always based in relation to the normative data, um, which is, you know, the general solid line here uh, in the T-scores. Uh, but it still can be quite useful in, in knowing whether or not these elevations are consistent with the range of what you typically see in these contexts, or if they're even more elevated than what you typically would see in these contexts. And then finally, I point out that there's also a percent scoring after below the test taker, which can essentially be interpreted as percentile ranks uh, in relation to the comparison group. So for instance, you see 100 here for stress, worry, anxiety, and anger proneness, which suggests that um, the uh, uh, 100%. So no one in the forensic pretrial criminal group scored as high as this particular person on stress, worry, anxiety, and anger proneness, which again, even in relation to the forensic pretrial comparison group, reflects a rather severe level of emotional dysregulation. Uh, that was a super helpful clarification. Um, so thank you for going and taking the time to go over that. Um, so that's all the questions that we have time for, and I think we hit almost all of them, if not all of them. So I want to thank everybody for their interest and attendance in the webinar. You're going to get an exit survey on your way out, and if you could share with us any uh, feedback that you would like to, we would greatly appreciate that. Dr. Selbaum, thank you so much for sharing your expertise um, in this uh, wonderfully informative uh, webinar that you offered us today. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thanks, everyone.